Good morning, everyone. My name is Jaime Sepulveda. I'm the director of the Institute for Global Health Sciences at UCSF. Today, as part of our weekly COVID series, we have a superb group of panelists on a very important uh, uh, topic, which is um, health related to COVID. Um, this is uh, clearly a direct consequence of the COVID pandemic. And this uh, needs to be addressed uh, properly. We have three panelists, all of them uh, faculty at UCSF, looking at um, both the clinical and the social aspects of uh, the pandemic from the perspective of uh, global health. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Bifhav Acharya. He's uh, a clinical professor of psychiatry at UCSF. Uh, we have Dr. Maria Trent, uh, who is uh, also um, in the Department of uh, Medicine, a professor of medicine. And uh, we have Dr. Susan Mefford, who's an associate professor at the Department of uh, Psychiatry. So with these three exceptional panelists, uh, we will take um, a, a shot from different perspectives at the topic, and then we will um, ask uh, panelists to respond to questions from the audience. So, um, Dr. Charlie, you have the floor. Thank you, Jaime. And uh, thanks everyone for, for setting this up. I'm gonna share my screen and we get started. All right. So I'll be mainly speaking about uh, rural Nepal, where I do most of my work, and uh, how we transitioned our existing mental health services uh, in, in, in light of COVID sort of imposed restrictions. And I'll sort of have two themes in particular in terms of how we made these adaptations. So before we get started, just to get everyone on the same page, you know, Jaime alluded to this as well, COVID has a huge impact on mental health. So I'm going to just list some of the various ways uh, that mental health is affected by the pandemic and the consequence sort of, of, of the lockdown. Uh, obviously, everyone's feeling the fear of illness uh, and death, some more in denial than others, uh, as you can see from the news. Uh, but, but clearly, the, the idea that this would, I, I could get it and I can die from it is real, uh, contributing to anxiety. A lot of people have lost jobs, and that is by itself a huge traumatic uh, event for a lot of people. Add to that the pandemic and the lockdown. Uh, again, leading to a lot of anxiety. People are lonely. And for folks who actually have been in close quarters with others, there's also the increased risk of conflict. Uh, people sort of not, not having the usual space uh, they have and not knowing what to do with each other when they see each other all the time. That's actually been beginning to, it seems kind of you know, comical in the beginning, but people realize that it is, it is a big deal, that it's leading to conflict and increased stress. Uh, there's general uncertainty about the future. How long is this going to last for? What's going to happen? What's, what's going to happen to me and my loved ones? Obviously, a huge contributor to anxiety is uncertainty. Uh, and a lot of people have uh, become caregivers as their family members become sick. And, 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 and at the same time, uh, people who already had a prior diagnosis of mental illness, like schizophrenia, depression, and so on, they've had disruptions in their care. So difficulty in accessing care, difficulty especially around the world, difficulty in accessing medications and lab work and, and just a disruption of regular care that's worsening their uh, mental illness. Uh, there's increased substance use and alcohol use as people turn to these for coping. Um, there's more domestic violence and child abuse. Again, as the usual sort of buffers of both time and space are taken away, uh, there's just increased risk of both uh, domestic violence and child abuse. People have lost family members uh, leading to grief, uh, and then healthcare workers and sort of other frontline workers, like people who cannot stay at home uh, and to do their work, um, they face additional stressors as well. And, and around the world, and even to some extent in the US, we're seeing stigma against uh, high-risk groups. So healthcare workers in, in Nepal, we've heard from community members telling the community health workers, do not come to our house. And this is before the lockdown when they were still doing visits uh, because they were seen as being associated with the healthcare system, which is associated with COVID. And you know, there are examples like this from Ebola, for example. Uh, and then uh, immigrants as well. So you know, people who 
uh, worked elsewhere and for all sorts of reasons are now coming back uh, to, to their original home uh, or their country. And, and they, they're seen as outsiders sort of, you know, bringing in this, this potentially dangerous uh, virus. And then something that I have noticed uh, in, in Nepal is, uh, and I'm sure others have seen this around the world, especially in the global south, uh, that the coping mechanisms uh, have been disrupted because so much of coping really was uh, communal, you know, shared. And then those rituals, those activities are just not happening at the level anymore. Uh, sorry, Maria, were you, were you gonna say something? I also see something in the Q&A, but uh, all right, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, if there's something, please someone flag me because I see something opening up in the Q&A, but, uh, but yeah, let me know if I need to respond to anything. Uh, just just uh, listing the sources of funding for the work that I've been describing. I'm gonna keep going. So the setting is, is rural Nepal. So this is a, a district um, called Atam, which is about 30 hours from, from the capital. And uh, it's the poorest district in the country, has the worst rates of HIV and, and more uh, sort of other economic and social and healthcare indicators as well. And this is the, this is a site where I've worked uh, for the last uh, 12 years. Uh, this is a hospital uh, technically owned by the government, but operated by um, uh, the nonprofit that I co-founded called Possible and its Nepali counterpart called Nyaya Health Nepal. It's a 60 bed hospital, which is where we did our first mental health study, um, which I'll briefly talk about. And, and then after the Nepal earthquakes in 2015, uh, our nonprofit expanded the, the first model of the primary care system to another 60 bed hospital in a in, in district where 85% of the infrastructure was uh, destroyed by, uh, by the earthquake. So, so the mental health services were set up in both of these two districts in, in rural Nepal. And, and, the, and the initial work was done by uh, grant funded research. But after the research period was over, the, the hospital saw the value in the mental health services uh, model and they continued it. So let me just describe quickly what that uh, mental health model looks like. So it's an adaptation of the collaborative care model, if people have heard of that. And the idea is, I'm not going to go through the, the whole detail, but the idea is there's a team-based approach. There's a consultant psychiatrist who's off-site. It's a very rural site, so it's very tough to recruit uh, specialists like psychiatrists on-site. So this person's off-site, while the primary care team that comprises of a doctor or a health assistant, similar to a PA in the U.S., and a counselor, they work together. And by team, I really mean they get together and they, they evaluate patients together and they come up with a treatment plan together while the consulting psychiatrist reviews all these plans every week to make sure that you know, people are not falling through the cracks and you know, high quality care is being dispensed. And then they also come in every quarter to the site uh, to actually travel to the hospital and provide training and supervision. And sometimes they might see complex uh, patients when they're there. But in, in telemedicine speak, this is, you know, asynchronous with the patient. So the, although they're offsite and they do this weekly consultation uh, on the phone or video, they do it with the providers. They don't do it in synchrony with the patients. So it's an asynchronous telemedicine model that had been going on. And you also have community health workers, as you all know, who sort of uh, live in the communities of the patients and then bring them to the clinic and monitor adherence uh, as necessary. So this is the model that had been going on until, of course, uh, COVID came by. And this is a picture of a fever clinic that was set up uh, at one of the clinics, at one of the hospitals. And, and COVID, as we talked about, affected mental health in a, in a very substantial kind of way. Uh, and, 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 the, and the restrictions imposed was really sort of militarized and incredibly strict, uh, as has been the case in much of the global south. Um, and, and that led to a lot of disruption, people not being able to get care, while the anxiety and depression and sort of stress level continued to increase. So the first uh, thing to do, of course, was to transition into telemedicine. And like I said, except for the psychiatrist calling the primary care, everything else was in person. Despite the remoteness, despite the terrain, patients would travel to the hospital. Often several hours, community health workers would travel home to home. So the, the infrastructure just wasn't there to do telemedicine. So that was the first, uh, first challenge. And, and, and I show these pictures as just uh, to give you a sense of the disparity in the country, right? So the top picture is Kathmandu, the capital, and the bottom is a village. Uh, it's a very typical village. It's not, it's not isolated for sure uh, in terms of how representative it is. It's a very typical community uh, near, <clears throat> near where the hospital is. And, 
and it, it simply does not have the kind of infrastructure that you would expect in a, in a capital uh, in terms of digital technology, reliability of power and energy and things like that. So let me, let me quickly go through the, the way we sort of uh, tackle some of the challenges that came up in telemedicine. So this is one of our counselors uh, using telemedicine. And, and the first challenge was actually just provider discomfort. They were like, we've never done this. And it's by phone. So, you know, because, because the bandwidth isn't strong enough for people to do video calls. So it's by phone and they felt, they felt like it was impossible. They're like, I, I need to be able to see the person. How am I gonna know their facial expressions, nonverbal communication, it's all gonna be lost. And I get it, you know, at UCSF, I've been doing video calls for, for many years before COVID. Uh, and even that felt uncomfortable in the beginning, but doing a phone call is much harder. So, but, but the unfortunate thing here is that there is no other choice, right? So we sort of said, you know, come out and acknowledge how uncomfortable it is. Come out and just tell, you know, the patient that it is awkward for them, awkward for you, and just laugh about it as much as you can. And, and some of the things that we asked them to tell the, the patients was to sort of say, listen, I'm not going to know how you're feeling because I can't see you right now. And it's unfortunate that the burden's on you to sort of tell me how you're feeling and I'm not going to be able to just you know, assess how you're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know, rely on you to tell me if this is getting too much or you know, if this is not relevant to you, the kind of things that we would usually pick up in nonverbal communication. And also I'm going to purposefully pause and sort of check in to see how this is landing. So that, that was really helpful to just make them feel comfortable that it is possible to have phone calls and still do good counseling. Um, the other problem as you know, around the world is that there really is no appointment system. Most things will be called primary care are actually functioning in an urgent care model where people line up and whoever is available, it will sort of see the, see the next patient. And that makes it difficult to do telemedicine. So a lot of the clinicians were just playing phone tag uh, and, and we were forced to you know, create at least some kind of an appointment system where they would text the patient's phone at the beginning of the day and say, we will call you at 3 p.m. Because other than that, it was really difficult because, you know, people were just playing phone tags. So it almost forced us to you know, implement some kind of an appointment system. The other challenge was one phone was shared by a household. And I say a plus because sometimes it was, you know, neighbors also sharing the same phone. So that raised some concerns about privacy and just uh, in terms of the texting. So we got the wording right to make sure we don't reveal who it is. And you're just saying someone from clinic needs to talk to you. Um, and also practically counselors are saying, you know, people are not opening up. They just seem like, oh, they want to have a short call and they hang up and I don't know why. And I was like, it's probably because it's not private. So one of the things we asked them to do was, can you just, at the beginning, can you say, hey, I, you probably don't have a private space right now. Can you go? I'll wait a couple of minutes, just something very practical. And that helped the, because you know, patients are not used to it either, help the patients get away from the crowd and just, you know, of their family rather. And then, uh, and then go to a place that's a little bit more private so they can have this conversation. And of course, the final problem was the needs, you know, substantially exceeded the capacity of the telemedicine system. And we faced this here as well. So self-help was going to be a huge part of this because everyone was feeling anxiety and UCSF has created psychiatry department has created amazing resources for self-help, including, you know, guided videos. So that, that created a push to do some kind of a self-help based material. And when I looked at the, what kind of material is, is available for the public, uh, not for patients, but just in general, the public, uh, we really found materials that were sort of about, you know, if you have a fever, stay at home, don't share a product, sort of the, the basic uh, do's and don'ts of COVID rather than for mental health. So we really found uh, a huge gap in self-help materials uh, that were easily accessible by the local public, um, but done in sort of, you know, Nepali rather than in English. And, and, and that's where I spent a lot of my time doing. And what really helped me was going back to these experiences I've had, like this one in this picture, where you know, something that I love to do when I visit Nepal is to go see people at their homes and, and where I have to sort of use the language that they understand rather than the most sort of jargony or you know, English-infused uh, Nepali that I tend to speak with coworkers or colleagues. Uh, so, so, you know, this is pretty straightforward stuff, but like using colloquial versus technical terms when we created self-help materials, and using accessible analogies rather than sort of abstract concepts like bell curves and whatever. Uh, one concept to, to describe was um, if you have no anxiety, it's actually not very good. If you have too much anxiety, that's not good either. You need to have your appropriate level of anxiety. And the first version included a bell curve to show that and it's too abstract. Um, <coughs> but the analogy we used was 
sorry, Maria, I think you're on, you're unmuted. Uh, can you mute yourself, please? Uh, and, uh, and, and the analogy we used was that of a slingshot, like, you know, something that everyone uses. So if you pull a slingshot too hard, they could break. If you don't pull it, it doesn't work at all. You need to pull it just right. So to explain that the goal isn't to have a zero anxiety, some anxiety is actually helpful because it might help you do the things that are good for you in terms of being careful about hand washing and things like that. Um, and my benchmark was, I'm going to create materials that my grandma, who never went to school, would have to be able to understand. And we did a lot of iteration and received feedback to make sure that it was comprehensible to the local public. Uh, and so this resulted in, in a five videos. Again, the language is sort of about stress. How do you reduce stress? How do you, you know, help reduce stress rather than you know, specific kind of anxiety disorders or you know, acute stress reaction, which is more technical. And, and this was, uh, this was you know, spread out through YouTube, Facebook, and just the, the media that people end up uh, using. And while this was happening, this ended up getting the attention of the Nevada government. And in parallel, the Nepali government was actually bringing back Nepali workers who were stranded abroad. So just to contextualize, so Nepal actually ranks number three, it's right here. If you look at the percentage of GDP that comes from remittance. So people think like tourism is a big deal in Nepal, it is, but it actually the biggest chunk of the GDP is manual laborers living abroad, sending money back home. And after COVID, a lot of them lost their jobs, Many of them were undocumented, so they could not access care. And a lot of them were essentially starving because they didn't know where else to go and they were, they were you know, packed up in, in tiny apartments. So, so the Nepali government had a lot of pressure to bring them back. And someone in the ministry saw these videos and they said, can you create something also for practical problem solving? Because a lot of the folks we're bringing back are going to be incredibly stressed out. We want to show them how to decrease stress, but we also want to teach them how to just solve problems so they can get a job after they get here. Uh, rather than sort of feel overwhelmed. So that led to another series of self-help videos on problem solving therapy. It's an evidence-based mechanism uh, that we've used uh, to in, in, in helping people with adversity. And then well, once this was released, uh, got in touch with uh, a, a satellite dish provider who is actually now planning on improving the graphics, because I don't know how to do video editing, um, and, and broadcasting this for free for the public. And, and, and I want to point this out just in terms of, you know, this is so far from research, right? This is not what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, but this is where the need was. And, and, and the goal was to just, just spread it out to the public as much as possible. Uh, so this is going to be the last uh, slide. And, and this is bringing me to this idea that like, you know, there's a crisis. Absolutely. I'm not trying to minimize that, but there's clearly an opportunity here as well. The first is that this has forced us to accelerate telemedicine at UCSF around the world, definitely in Nepal. And the second thing that absolutely would not have happened pre-COVID is that the level of awareness and the demand, there's no way I would have government and primary care providers and the media and the general public sort of saying, we need more material for mental health support. Um, that's been the silver lining, uh, and, and our team has been doing an amazing job sort of uh, trying to meet that need uh, at, the, at the public level. All right, that's all I had for now, and I think we're going to do Q&A at the very end. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Acharya. Um, a reminder to the audience to please pose your questions in the Q&A icon. Um, Dr. Maria Ekstrand, you have the floor. Thank you, Jaime, and thanks, Bibov. That was really interesting. Um, I learned something new every time I listen to you. Um, let's see here. This should be my slides. Okay, so I'm. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about our work in India that um, started off focusing on, um, on HIV management. And we, like many other people around the globe, have had to pivot um, following um, the uh, global pandemic. Um, so this, these are my colleagues, both at UCSF and at the St. John's Medical College and Research Institute, where I have worked since um, 2002. So, long time. Um, so uh, like in many other uh, settings, uh, late March, the Indian government decided to go on lockdown. 
And as Bibab was saying about Nepal, India's lockdown was, um, was uh, very restrictive, lots of, uh, lots of severe rules and punishments um, if you didn't follow the, the, various, uh, the various rules. And um, um, many, people, many people who are day laborers or migrants um, uh, immediately fled back to their native villages because they had no source of income and, and often no place to live anymore in the cities. Um, and there are a lot of heartbreaking stories of migrants walking for days or weeks on the freeways um, to get home. Um, and um, since my interest is in HIV, we have, we have uh, several cohorts that we are following um, to study their ability to manage uh, their disease and the impact of stigma on, on their health. And um, we immediately became very worried about them because they're already, um, uh, they already vulnerable um, to negative health outcomes. And we had no idea how they were managing during this global pandemic. Um, so we um, decided to um, shift focus a bit um, and um, examine in our cohort of, um, of HIV infected uh, participants. We have a little over 500 people living with HIV that we're following as part of what we call the Tell Me Box study. And the Tell Me Box is a uh, pill box where um, where we, uh, where we get um, real-time wireless data every time that they open the lid. So for those of you who are familiar with the Wise Pill or, or other similar devices, this is a low-cost Indian version that we designed together with uh, engineering students from a nearby college. <clears throat> so following the March 25th lockdown, St. John's Research Institute decided that Nobody could do any in-person research anymore, um, like in many other places around the world. And um, so we decided to follow up with our participants via phone instead to gather any cohort data that didn't require um, uh, either phlebotomy or, or hair uh, collection. We also developed a supplemental questionnaire to uh, examine mental health and COVID-related issues. Um, and this was the reason we did that. Um, any, any given day in the newspaper or, or online, this is what you are confronted with when you're in India. Um, the, the government uh, decided to color code all the districts in India into red, orange, yellow, and orange, depending on COVID prevalence. They launched an, a smartphone app where they will give you information every day about what you're supposed to do and also supposedly alert you if you're nearby somebody um, who is infected. They've created containment zones which keep varying in size almost on a weekly basis. Sometimes it's a three kilometer radius around where somebody who has tested positive lives. Sometimes it's a block and uh, there are multiple rules that you are supposed to follow um, from six to 12. One week you may be able to travel two kilometers um, for, for essential purchases and not at all in the afternoon and then next week that may change. And as you can see in these pictures, uh, even the police got into this for anybody who doesn't read papers or, or look on the web. And they're all dressed up as the Lord of Death Yamaraj or as the with coronavirus helmets and run around and, and harass people who are not following the rules. So enough to cause anxiety in anybody, I think. Um, and, and even more so if you're already um, in a vulnerable population. So we added some measures to our uh, cohort questionnaire. We asked people about changes in demographics asked them where they got information and how much trust they had in those sources. We asked them about their confidence in uh, maintaining their HIV regimen, making it to the clinic, refilling their prescription, asked them about what they worried about, 
how much medication they have. Um, and we gave them two scales to measure anxiety and depression that have been validated in India, asked them about social support and various barriers to managing their HIV that, um, that mattered to them. So we did this twice, once during the first month of lockdown and once during the second month. And out of our cohort of 509 people, we managed to get hold of 467 over the phone. Um, in general, I think people were pretty well informed. This was just a couple of weeks into the lockdown and people already knew how you get, um, how you may get infected. They knew what they needed to do to prevent transmission. They knew what the symptoms were. There were a few misconceptions and um, I put the misconception about receiving packages from China here because China is always kind of a ghost in the background of the mind of, of many Indians. And of course, given that the pandemic started in Wuhan, it's, it's not surprising that um, receiving a package from China was, was a, a misconception that most had as, as a way that the virus may get transmitted. Um, what I thought was hopeful from this uh, is that even though fewer people had received information from their um, physicians or HIV clinic, if they, if they had, they trusted them greatly. So trust is important. Um, so this is what we found in terms of anxiety and depression. Um, about 16 and a half percent did report on this anxiety scale that they had at least mild anxiety disorder. Um, fewer were diagnosed as, as depressed. Um, almost a quarter reported that they had less than two weeks worth of medication at home. And um, about 60% said that they were confident that they could make it into the clinic during the, the pandemic to refill their prescriptions. And um, all of these were important. Um, uh, all of these worries and barriers were important in terms of determining who was confident and who wasn't. So if you didn't have much medication, if you were worried about infection, and if you were anxious or depressed, you were much uh, less likely to be confident in your ability to go to the clinic. Um, the, um, Upside is that if you did receive your COVID info from the a ART clinic, you were more confident, more likely to be very confident. So that's, that's an important thing for us to think about. Um, we came back the second month, got hold of 450 people at that point, and asked them more specifically about uh, what their perceived barriers were and also asked about uh, other stressors. So a month into the, into the lockdown, 85% um, said that they had lost income. 72% were worried about their ability to meet expenses. Almost half didn't have any transportation and there was some food insecurity as well. Um, the worries that we saw in the first month were still there and in addition, um, this, this um, cohort of people living with HIV were very concerned that the police was going to stop and harass them on their way to the clinic and that they would have to disclose at that point that they were living with HIV, which is something that is very stigmatized and people usually tries to, try to avoid doing. So how did, that, how did these factors uh, act as barriers to actually visiting the clinic? So we're no longer talking about confidence we asked them, did you visit the clinic? And we find that most of these did serve as barriers. So worrying that you'll run out of your medication, worrying about infection in the clinic um, or on the way to the clinic, and uh, worrying that your HIV will make you more um, vulnerable to negative outcomes, uh, being concerned about the, uh, about the police harassing you, um, uh, and uh, not having transportation were all uh, associated with not uh, having gone to the clinic. So, so that's, that's a concern. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I think the bottom line here, um, since I'm running out of time, is that um, 
we we can we can improve confidence and we can improve uh, decrease their worry and their anxiety um, if we just um, have the opportunity to talk to to patients and it can it still can't really happen in real time so and uh, the ART clinic counselors are doing a great job whenever they are able to talk to uh, to patients but they are overworked and um, they don't have time to to track them down so our next step now is going to be more along the lines of what Viva was uh, describing for us in Nepal. Uh, we're planning on training uh, paraprofessionals um, in collaboration with and under the supervision of psychiatrists and psychologists um, who can provide uh, weekly supervision and ongoing training as needed uh, to help um, to help people decrease their worry, decrease their anxiety, and problem solve these various barriers. So, um, so that, that is the next step that we're taking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. That was an excellent presentation. Um, may I ask Dr. Susan Meffert to take the floor now, please? Sure, hello to everyone. I wish I could see the audience. And I'm sure there are lots of people out there that I know, but I'm so sorry I can't say a direct hello to you. Um, let me get my presentation going here. All right. And just gonna make sure that comes up. Okay. Working. Can see? Great, thank you. So again, hello to everyone. Um, I know there are lots of people out there that I that I know well and, and would love to smile and wave at. Um, and, and lots of people that I haven't had a chance to meet yet. So happy to be here today. I'm going to start out with um, just a little background on our mental health research program in Kenya and a, a little data for those of you who are not familiar with global mental health as a field. And then we'll take a case study from our current trial called Smart Dapper. So I'm sure most of you have heard of the DALIs, which are the major disability uh, measure from the Global Burden of Disease study. They're crucial to the field of global mental health because they were some of the first metrics that actually revealed the burden of mental disorders worldwide. They're calculated, as you may know, by adding the years of life lost to a disability plus the years of life spent uh, living with that disability. And it's the YLD that reveals the real burden of mental disorders. Mental disorders create a huge burden of disability worldwide. This is looking specifically at Eastern Sub-Saharan Africa where mental disorders create a burden of 5 million, over 5 million YLDs. That's YLDs on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. You can see um, another important characteristic of, the ment of mental disorders is that they start at a young age. That's in contrast to our usual understanding of how comorbidities mount up in older years. Mental disorders start at a young age, and if they're not treated, they last for the duration of one's life many times. So why is it that we have such a huge burden of mental disorders globally? Well, one of the primary problems is that 75% of people who have serious mental disorders, things as simple and common as depression in low and middle income countries never receive any treatment at all. So there's, very, there's terrible access to mental health care uh, in the public sector in most low and middle income countries. And that's certainly true in Kenya. I keep talking about mental disorders, which are, am I talking about? Again, this is nothing frightening, exotic, or dangerous. This is kind of bread and butter for any mental health clinician who works anywhere in the world. Depression accounts for the vast majority of disability caused by mental disorders, over 35% of DALIs. Next is anxiety, about 22%. And schizophrenia, although the prevalence is low, the disability is high, so it does come in number three. The World Health Organization says that globally, depression is the single largest contributor to disability and that anxiety disorders come in number six. 
Africa is no exception. As you can see circled there, the far right on the diagram, for both men and women, there's a very high level of prevalence of disability, prevalence of depression. And um, that is, is one of the things that we're addressing in our study. So I'll tell you briefly about some of our first work in, in Kenya, which started about 10 years ago and which forms the basis for our current work. The first study we did is called the MIND study. And it was a mental health uh, treatment for, H for HIV positive women exposed to gender-based violence who had depression and PTSD, the two most common sequelae of gender-based violence. We work with FACES, uh, which is an organization um, that is co-directed by Dr. Craig Cohen and Dr. Elizabeth Bakusi at uh, Camry. Craig Cohen, of course, is at UCSF. And they're a wonderful, uh, run a wonderful clinic called FACES, which has been in existence for long over a decade now in Kisumu area. So we partnered with them and based our work um, developing mental health care services and testing them integrated within the HIV clinic there. The type of treatment that we used is called interpersonal psychotherapy, IPT, and we used it because it uh, focuses on developing social support as a strategy for uh, addressing depression and PTSD. It's an extremely well-documented and highly evidence-based uh, strategy for treating depression and PTSD in high-income countries. And before our study, it had been used successfully by non-specialists, people with, without advanced medical or mental health training in East Africa. So our study took it up a level and used it within an HIV clinic delivered by non-specialists for HIV-positive women exposed to violence. We had a big study team. That former picture was just a fraction of them. And I mentioned IPT already, developed back in the 1980s, first-line treatment for depression, and also now first-line treatment for PTSD. So we had a simple study. Um, this was on a K award. We had about, um, a, we enrolled originally about 300 people, and we randomized them to receive IPT or waitlist. And after 12 weeks of treatment, three months, the waitlist group received IPT. So everyone received IPT uh, at some point during the study, and then we followed everyone out to 36 weeks. Primary outcomes, which are in submission right now, um, you can see everyone started out with MDD and PTSD, that's major depressive disorder and PTSD. And you can see that red line between uh, drops substantially between baseline and three months. That's the duration of the IPT treatment, three months. We also see that the black line, that's the waitlist group, drops during that time as well. In fact, it does drop significantly from baseline. We think that's primarily because this is a group of women who had never had a sympathetic listener in the past. Um, ask them questions about their experiences of violence and their emotions. Um, however, there was still a very significant difference between the treatment group and the waitlist group at three months. And then happily, after the waitlist group received IPT, between three months and six months, there was a further drop in the, in the prevalence of disease, which is on that y-axis. That was true for MDD alone, PTSD alone, and the combined condition. That's the bottom graph. Moving on now to SMART Dapper. So that the MIND study really formed the foundation for our current study, which is a randomized uh, SMART design, a sequential multiple assignment randomized trial. It's funded by two R01s. One is uh, an R01 directly from NIMH, and the other is an R01 that's co-funded by the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease and NIMH. We have a robust study team. Dr. Musani Mathai is uh, MPI on DAPR, and I am MPI on that, on that study as well, and then I'm PI on the SMART study. We have a wonderful team spanning Uganda, Kenya, and many places all over the United States, including many, of course, from UCSF and uh, from University of Nairobi and Kemri. So the study uh, focuses on a a clinic um, in, focuses on a large hospital called Kisumu County Hospital that sees about 10,000 adult primary care patients every month. 
um, in that population, there are many who have HIV, even though the general population prevalence is only about 20% inside this uh, public sector primary care setting. In our pra practice patient population, we're seeing more than 50% with HIV. So although we don't require HIV as a diagnosis, we are treating many with HIV. Inside this primary care setting, prevalence of depression is huge, about 26%, PTSD even higher, 35%, and almost no one receives any formal mental health care in these public sector primary care services. So um, we integrated our system following the footsteps of PEPFAR in the region, which is to integrate on a, on a sort of a hospital campus level with an additional building um, that provides help um, for mental health and takes referrals from the clinics around the hospital campus. The overall goal, according to this RFA, is to support scale up. So we're doing that in a number of different ways. Our work at Kisumu County Hospital is, um, is not only a study, it's also a way to develop and refine a prototype for scale up across the different counties in Kenya and in Uganda. In these two countries, healthcare dollars are located at the county level. So um, in one sense, that means that um, you only have to convince uh, a county to invest in mental health. On the other hand, that means you have to go county by county and make your argument at each in each setting. Um, in order to help with that, we have on our investigative team, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Simon Kahonge and Dr. Hafsa Sintango, who are the heads of mental health for Kenya and Uganda, respectively. They've been very on board with this study, have been very helpful in sorting out uh, formal strategies for getting the products of our, of our study and our study plans out to the directors of health for counties across Kenya and Uganda. So ultimately, we certainly hope to spread this up and that's one of the, um, spread this out. This is one of the major goals of the work to um, present positive findings to other counties and facilitate their, their scale up. This, these are the formal objectives of the Smart Dapper study, and I won't go through these in detail, but essentially um, we, are going, we are going to be determining the effectiveness of these non-specialist delivered IPT and fluoxetine um, treatments alone or in combination, first line or second line. And critically, we're going to be developing first and second line non-specialist treatment algorithms. They will be costed in order to create a kind of a menu for policymakers at the county and, and national level. If we look at the diagram format, this is uh, how the study lays itself out. We have a, a large study of about 2,700 people. The first point of randomization is to IPT for three months versus fluoxetine for three months. That's another name for fluoxetine is Prozac. Those are standard courses of treatment. IPT is typically delivered over 12 sessions and fluoxetine first, uh, for the first treatment at, uh, duration is typically six months. We do a post-treatment assessment, and for those people that are not in complete remission from everything they had at baseline, they are re-randomized to either switch to the other treatment arm or continue with the one they're on and add the other one for a combination treatment. Then we follow everyone out to 30 months. We have a robust set of outcome measures, and that is in order to that that is used to collect baseline characteristics that we can feed into our our models to develop treatment algorithms so we can predict um, what type of treatment would be best depending on the baseline characteristics of someone who comes in for care and of course all of the measures that we need for costing and cost benefit analyses. So we were all ready to go. This was about March of this year. We had passed all of the approvals. We'd gone through the NIMH um, the NIH uh, monitoring appointments, we'd passed uh, national, regional approval systems and um, trained everyone, developed our database and our protocols uh, for this large study, done all the diplomacy work necessary, gotten our, our space sorted, et cetera. And then COVID-19 arrived. So uh, we had to rethink things. So in, uh, in Kenya, much as the way Maria was talking about India, uh, the the government 
be became quite strict about what could uh, what its what its citizens could do and what they could not do. One thing they couldn't do, uh, as we also tried to limit here, were non -essential, non essential outpatient visits. So that of course impacted the number of people coming into primary care at our hospital, where we're located at Kasumu County Hospital. Not to mention the fact, more importantly, that it was not particularly safe to be delivering face to face care. In, um, in a setting like that with COVID escalating. So we decided we needed to step back, think about the whole picture of what was going on with COVID in Kenya and, and sort out our best next step. So in Kenya, uh, there has been also sounding a lot like what Maria mentioned in, in India, there's been quite a strict government and police enforcement of social distancing and movement restrictions. You can see in that first, uh, the photo on the upper right, those men who are running. If you look closely, you can see in the background, they're running from police. So those men are running to a ferry right around the time of curfew. So Kenya often uses curfews to restrict mobility. Um, and they're afraid that those police are going to catch up with them before they get to the ferry and use their batons on them. There's a great deal of anxiety and worry about being um, physically hurt by the police who are enforcing mobility and uh, restrictions and social distancing guidelines in Kenya, which adds to the general anxiety generated by COVID. Happily, on the other side, we have had a lot of discussion of mental health care needs um, related to COVID in Kenya. You can see in the upper left, that's a news, uh, news piece, a, a talk discussion about mental health care needs um, using experts on the topic. You can see the news article below that from the East African pandemic driving Kenyans into the jaws of mental health issues, rather graphic title, but at least they're bringing attention to the fact that it's an issue. And then perhaps most happily uh, is that photo in the bottom right. That's uh, one of the leaders from the Kenyan MOH who said just, uh, just recently on June 21st, quote, there have been many unforeseen challenges. One of those is a silent killer and that is depression. COVID-19 has particularly affected our mental health. I'd say overall, Kenya has repeatedly highlighted this issue of the mental health repercussions of COVID-19 and they've done a good job at that. Putting this in a biopsychosocial model, which is our, um, our typical way of, of encapsulating things in mental health. Uh, COVID-19 in Kenya, this is, these are isolating some of the variables that I think are specific to Kenya, because of course, COVID-19 does not affect the mental health of everyone the same way, and um, it's context-driven. So for example, depending on the police reaction, depending on the, uh, the cultural norms, et cetera. So if we look in Kenya, a few of the specific things that have affected mental health um, the social distancing has been a huge factor. This is an extremely religious community that depends on going to church on a weekly basis and gathering that way. Uh, it's an essential part of their culture. Likewise, funerals and gatherings to honor the dead are very, very important in this setting and can cause a lot of traumatic grief when people are unable to honor uh, family members or friends who've passed away because uh, mask, uh, those types of large gatherings are prohibited. Also, that one of their primary coping skills, as I alluded to earlier, is social support. So they can't use that except for perhaps the people in their household if they're living with others, um, that, which is something they use on an almost moment-to-moment -moment basis, typically. Um, one, of the, one of the most remarkable things I noticed when I first started working in Kenya is the, the number of friendships and, and interconnections between people there. A, a common, if you ask someone how many friends they have, a common answer would be upwards of 300. They have huge numbers of, of social networks and they use them frequently on a daily basis. Of course, the massive job loss, this is particularly hard hitting in the region of Kenya where I work. Many people have small um, personal businesses and day laborers are also uh, make a, a large proportion of our participant population. Hard to get new jobs, they're often requiring negative COVID tests and that of course requires time and money and the cost of transport have increased because um, the ridership has been um, has been required to decrease and therefore they're passing on the costs um, to increase cost per person, which makes things even harder psychologically. 
as I mentioned, the strict curfews, the movement restrictions, the fear of the police, the traumatic grief, and not to mention this backdrop of the HIV uh, traumatic history of this country with the HIV epidemic, um, which is still going on. Just like HIV, there's now stigma against the survivors of COVID and the healthcare workers. Just like HIV, there's now stigma against the truck drivers who really brought a lot of HIV into the country. Now there's worry that they're bringing in the COVID. And just like HIV, there's fear now that COVID testing might lead to one being stigmatized. You know, people with HIV were often avoiding testing and dying rather than getting tested and getting treatment. They preferred just to die of it rather than ever know their status. Finally, there's the biological model, which is biological stressors and components that are just emerging now. Um, we have anecdotal evidence at this point that there are neuropsychiatric sequelae of COVID-19 and that might be operate, operated through immunological mechanisms, um, a common suspect for these sort of systemic um, inflammatory diseases. We don't know yet exactly what those biological sequelae will be. So stepping out of the kind of medical model and trying to get you in touch with the voices of people on the ground, this is a post that came through yesterday on the WhatsApp group I belong to, Kasumu Mental Health Fora. And the first thing to notice is not all the words, but simply to look at the number of crying emojis that we have in this text. This is very unusual for this forum. Essentially, this is a, a woman who, um, whose brother died of COVID and he was taken away by a COVID team, so to speak, and taken to a hospital that, um, or one of the healthcare centers that's dedicated to COVID. And um, he didn't come back and they found out eventually that he died, but they didn't know where his body was, where even if he had received treatment, um, where he died, how they could retrieve his body or any piece of what was left of him. And you can see here just a graphic example of the sort of, um, the sort of traumatic grief that the current COVID restrictions are enforcing, the secrecy and, and um, at least the, I should say the effects of the firm um, restrictions that police are putting in place. And um, that's been important, of course, but on the other hand, it also causes this uh, difficulty with getting information, the restrictions of family from accessing people who have died, and um, creates a lot of a lot of grief in the, in the fact that they can't um, honor the dead the way that they would like to. So um, after thinking through all of the things that were going on, some of the things at least that were going on with mental health and COVID-19 in Kenya, what we ultimately decided is that what we had in front of us was really a transformative opportunity. We knew that people needed mental health care more than ever. Their depression and PTSD symptoms were escalating rapidly, both um, those who already had the disease and uh, new onset disease, and that, was, that fell squarely within the wheelhouse of our Smart Dapper study. And yet we also knew that we couldn't see people face to face in a safe way at this point. So we decided that uh, we would adapt and augment our Smart Dapper treatments to deliver them by telephone and also deliver our assessments by telephone. This would be then um, the first study of, scalable, of a scalable model of, not, of telephone based mental health care delivered by non specialists for MDD and or PTSD in Sub Saharan Africa. So, happily, it also contributes to the science. Here in the US, digital mental health care is uh, a fact of life. We use it all the time, it's very common. Um, but in fact, it was only just back in uh, about 10 years ago that we started developing it and testing it in a research format. We found that telephone care uh, without video, like we use now, was just as effective as face-to-face -face care. And um, that research, unfortunately, moved never got spread to these areas that could really use additional assistance with, um, with better access to mental health care, and instead moved right into research on what we're doing now, things like uh, video and online platforms to improve mental health. 
Meanwhile, these deficits uh, in access to mental health care persisted in Sub-Saharan Africa, despite the fact that the vast majority of people have access at least to a flip cell phone, perhaps not a smart a smartphone, but a flip cell phone. So we're hoping to fill that gap by uh, testing how we can deliver this treatment by telephone using non-specialists in this setting. And we're very hopeful that that will not only help tremendously during the COVID epidemic in Kenya, but will also um, help support further scale up of mental health care long after the COVID epidemic. So I'll stop Super. there. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, we are running out of time, but I know my colleague Mark has uh, questions from the audience. Hannah. Yeah, so, um, and, and you know, what we did last time when we ran out of time, uh, we did follow up with the panelists to ask a few questions that they um, very kindly answered. And I think Robert shared them on the YouTube channel. So perhaps that's something we can do now since we only have six minutes, but, um, uh, the first question uh, that we have is for Dr. Acharya. Uh, how do you manage medication prescription through the telemedicine program in Nepal? Yeah, so for the, for the initial collaborative care model, the, the primary care providers can actually write prescriptions. Uh, and after COVID, uh, patients are actually allowed to travel if it's to seek um, medical care. So there's, there's a mechanism we can get an exception from the, from the curfew and the lockdown. Uh, so people are able to come to the pharmacy and then pick up the medications. Um, Dr. Ekstrom, how do you link COVID as an attributable risk of depression in India? Um, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but but I can see that it's associated with uh, both their fears of uh, attending the clinic and and whether they they actually went. But um, we uh, we do have data from earlier waves on um, on depression in this sample, and I haven't had a chance to look at it yet because all these data are are brand new. Uh, but we will definitely go back and and look at that and see if there were changes over time. Um, both in terms of the supplement that we have uh, that we have given them, and also the regular uh, study wave uh, data, we uh, we interview all of our participants every three months. So we will definitely be able to see if there have been changes following COVID. Okay, great. Um, actually, another question uh, for you. Uh, okay. I, I think Teresa Muller asked this question in the Q and A box, and I believe she asked it uh, during your talk. So. She's wondering if the medical knowledge savvy of the cohort is a little higher because they have regular interaction with medical staff, more humanized. Are your paraprofessionals uh, a community health worker cohort? Um, I think I know what, what she's saying. Hi, Teresa. Um, so <clears throat> it's, it's entirely possible that because our cohort uh, is living with HIV that they are a bit savvier in terms of how to get information. Uh, but uh, when we interviewed them the first month, very few of them had, in fact, talked to their doctors or the clinics. So, uh, and 97% um, of them, I think, said that they had gotten information from the media, and that's obviously available to anyone. But, um, but yes, it has to be, the information has to be there, and you have to look. So, so it's, it's entirely possible that, uh, that they are more interested because they're, for them, it's their second pandemic, not their first. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and uh, Dr. Deroff, Dar Deroff um, asks a question actually both for, um, both for you, Dr. Ekstrin, and uh, Dr. Mefford. Uh, are there global local efforts to increase access to the technology like Dr. Acharya's in Nepal? And I believe he's referencing the um, the telemedicine? Mm -hmm. Definitely. I, I don't know about global efforts, but uh, the uh, St. John's Research Institute uh, is uh, working on that, and, and we're in the midst of uh, trying to write a supplement to our grant um, to try to implement that. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, there's certainly um, interest in doing digital mental health work in Kenya. Kenya um, 
unfortunately, it tends to be pretty data driven in their MOH. So they'll want to see the results of, of studies like the one that we're running before they would take it up as a policy. Okay, great. Dr. Mefford, if you could stay on. How prevalent is COVID-19 um, in your study areas? That's a great question. Um, I don't think I can confidently say because I don't think the testing has been adequate. Um, and, you know, they, for example, they had recently about a month ago said they'd seen no increase in the all cause death rate, which is often where you see COVID captured, even if the testing is not, is not up to par. Um, but it, it's hard to know the detailed statistics at this point. I would say I couldn't confidently answer it. One thing that protects Kenya is the relatively low age overall of the population. And there has been some, um, Maria, you may know about this, but there has been some sort of interesting data saying that the antiretrovirals are somewhat protective for people with COVID. So these high, for people, uh, to protect people against getting COVID. So these areas with really high HIV prevalence, there, there might be oddly some protection for, for that group rather than the increased vulnerability that we thought might happen. Um, Dr. Acharya, one more question for you, and I know we have, um, I know this is, this will be the last question, and then I have probably about like 25 more questions that I can send in an email to you all, and if you want to answer them, if you can, that would be great. Uh, Dr. Acharya, you described a model in your, um, in, uh, I, I guess, possible health is your organization. Is that, mod are you intending to test that model anywhere else or try to implement it anywhere else outside of Nepal? Yeah, so, so the model actually has been uh, tested largely in high income countries and, and, and Maria actually is testing uh, it in, in India as well. Uh, so, to, to, so there are efforts underway to test it out. Uh, the, the technology component is new, the community health workers component is new, and of course there's local variations. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is certainly spreading. Uh, as far as the Nepali government is concerned, so we, we do sort of um, you know, informal uh, technical support for them and they're interested in scaling up as well. So the neighboring districts, uh, district hospitals uh, are gonna uh, implement again, COVID's you know, making things harder, but, uh, but the, the goal is certainly to expand it uh, nationally for sure. Yeah. But it's happening globally as well. Okay, great, thank you. And I think we're at time, so. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent moderation. Thank you to our great panelists for a wonderful session. Uh, just uh, a reminder to the audience, next week, we will not have our regular COVID series because this is the International AIDS Society 2020 meeting. So um, we will see you two weeks from now. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.